I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ am I content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And it doesn't seem to make too much sense that in weakness there is strength. But for Paul in humility to both accept and proclaim his own weakness is to rely, therefore, not on his own eloquence, not on his own ability, nor on his own strength, but on the mercy, the love, and that almighty power of God himself. It doesn't say that Paul won't accomplish great things. He did does, ever shall be. And yet, not because Paul is so super awesome, but because God is. And just when he starts to get a little full of himself about how super awesome he must be, this thorn in the flesh, of which we have no idea what he's talking about, other than it's something that must hurt. It's something that must bother him. If you've ever had a thorn, especially one that you've stepped on, sometimes you can go for a long period of time and not pay any attention to it at all. And then you put pressure on just the wrong spot of, oh, and you've got to dig at it, you got to try to poke at it, and the ones that really get up in there, no matter how hard or how high up you dig, you can't seem to get it out, and you're just resigned to the fact that for a period of time, it's going to hurt. It's going to be lousy. It's going to be crummy. And so maybe you try to walk around it a little gingerly, but you can't really help yourself because at some point, you're going to step in just the wrong way. Ah! Ah! And there's nothing like a little prick of a thorn, such a small, tiny little thing, to make those who have decided that they are super awesome. They feel very, very ordinary. <coughs> feel very, very humble. Doesn't take much if you think about it. It's a great feel very, very small. So what Paul does with this thorn that he receives its affliction in essence as a gift. Thank you, Lord, for this suffering. Why? Because suffering is so much fun? Of course not. Paul is not crazy. And Paul is not weird. Paul understands that this regular sense of his humility, being reminded that he ain't all that, is allowing him to keep his heart and his mind on the giver of all good gifts and not the gifts themselves. Not his great power of eloquence. Not the legions of followers he inspires. But that if any good comes through his preaching and his teaching and his ministry, it comes from his good father. It comes from God's good word. And it comes from God's everlasting love and amazing grace. A little thorn now and again helps keep that head from overinflating, from that heart from wandering just too far away. It reminds us we broken vessels, we pots of clay. <coughs> treasure that is within us of exceeding value comes not from us but from God himself. Give me your tired, poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Those words engraved at the base of the Statue of Liberty. Given as a gift from 
France, to America, standing there, receiving so many countless numbers from poverty, destitution, hopelessness, or those simply seeking a new chance, a new start, a new life. As all of those who filed in one by one into Ellis <coughs> Island or similar places to see that torch held so close to them. To know these words were at the base of the feet. It's a poem called The New Colossus. In essence, <coughs> juxtaposing the Statue of Liberty with one of the wonders of the ancient world, the Colossus of Rhodes. The Colossus of Rhodes was also a giant statue right at the port of a great city. But this statue was one of a victorious soldier. That if you were going to come into Rhodes, you were going to be greeted by this fantastically large, well-armed and equipped, conquering hero. So when you came into Rhodes, you better know that they were the biggest, they were the baddest, they were the best. You didn't sneak in, you didn't come in casually. You came in passing by this giant soldier knowing that Rhodes assumed that they themselves were conquering heroes. And you better know that before you come ashore. With that sense of accomplishment and pride reversed now from the old Colossus, the conquering soldier, to a new Colossus. Not a man, but a woman. Not a conquering soldier, but a beacon of liberty and freedom. Not one who says, if you dare come my way, tremble and fear at my might and my power. But one that beckons all who would come. I don't need the best and the brightest and the bravest. I will take your worst. I will take your hungriest. I will take your lowliest. All of those who seek freedom, who seek liberty, Bring them to me. Do not send them away. This Colossus is not one of might and fear, but of welcome, of freedom, of hope. These words, I've often thought as applied to our particular church. In essence, these are gospel words. For what is Jesus rather than beckoning the world back to him? Not just the best and the brightest, but the smallest and the lowliest. Not just the successful, but the losers. Not just those who are fantastic and handsome and great. But those who are insignificant and broken. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I say it every Sunday, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world, Jesus will be God the Son. Right? Our Lord Jesus Christ stretched out his arm to the harbor of the cross, and all my power will reach the city of grace. Right? And yet, these gospel words applied particularly to our little parish. I had a discussion just this morning about noticing over the years, over the decades really, our parish being sort of a way station for so many people who come in, who find healing, who find freedom, who find restoration and renewal in Christ, and they leave. Go off someplace else. And there's a sadness to that. 
and yet a benefit while we were here for our parish by them, for them by our parish. This is a place that they're known and loved, a place where they can be safe and nurtured, a place where they can serve. A place that, you know, getting all that pretentious, I guess, but just simple and true message of the gospel, I believe, rings clear, shines bright. Where there are losers among us, the small, the insignificant, and the broken, and the hurting. Even guys who wear white robes and stoles and clerical collars who say, thanks be to God that he would love a loser like me. And to think perhaps that's within the character of our particular parish. People are received, they're loved, they're healed, go off. Sad. And yet, if that is a part of our history, perhaps a part of our character, it is also then a part of God's gift. There are those who are indeed tempest-tossed by life. There are those who feel like wretched refuse, perhaps leaving other churches in disgrace or in pain, perhaps being away or never, never having gone in the first place. People who feel homeless, yearning, be free. These tired huddled masses might find a home here for however long. Or they might find a home in the arms of our Lord forever and ever and ever. So maybe it's okay to be a way station at least in some level. We cannot boast in our magnificent buildings. We cannot boast in our extravagant budget. We cannot boast in our enormous attendance. We could, however, be content in our weakness. Even a couple of insults now and again. Maybe a hardship or a persecution or two. <coughs> Even a calamity, if that's what it takes. For when we are weak, it is not our abilities or nature that shines bright and clear and strong. It is the goodness of God. So may His torch shine bright here, shine bright in our own lives. Not like conquering heroes. And if you know it's good for you, you better fall in line. But as humble servants, you simply say, come to our Lord. All you who are heavy laden, you will find rest in Him. You might find rest in you. Rest for weary souls, for tired bodies. <laughs> broken hearts. It's not a bad thing. It actually seems pretty good. Something to be grateful for. Now before this turns into loser talk, <laughs> I want to point something out. I like these little coincidental moments. Many of you have heard me say that there are no coincidences, yeah. only times where we are graciously <coughs> offered a glimpse of God's goodwill, how it intersects and connects through all times, places, people, events. Open your bulletin back up, if you would, please, and look at that, uh, look at your scripture reading answer. 
up in the top corners of the front page, there are typically little crosses or little symbols. Uh, these tend to change periodically. Some of these are quite old that I've used for bulletins for years. And um, Priscilla sometimes reuses one or, or sometimes picks one that she just happens to like or, or, or whatever it might be. And, and sometimes they were directly uh, put for the readings. I don't know uh, how this one came about. It's one that I've used for years, and it could be that it just got reused. But this is a Greek symbol, and I think it's worth looking at. So before we just think that the church is a place where we all just kind of collapse and we're all sort of congratulating ourselves for how many failures we have or, or whatever, if you take a quick peek at this Greek symbol. Now, Greek cross, and then these are Greek capital letters around it. The top line is an abbreviation for, in the Greek, Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. Okay. It's the first letter and the last letter of, the, of his first name and of his last name in Greek. Bottom, well, that's its own Greek word. Nika. Jesus Christ, Nika. Jesus Christ, conqueror. This is a symbol of strength, of power, and of victory. Victory in Jesus. Yeah. For nearly 2,000 years, Jesus Christ Conqueror has been a symbol of the church, most especially in the East. The church in the East, if you know anything about your church history, has been kicked around by basically everybody. As a matter of fact, um, when we have our Wednesday... Uh, noon Eucharists, I use instead of the, the, the corporal on the altar, I use an antennas. That is kind of like the, 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 the linen cloth of the Orthodox Church given to me by my friend the Archbishop before he died. And uh, in Orthodoxy, you always use this antennas to put the bread and the wine on and to you know, say the Eucharistic prayers and everything. It, it's kind of like that white corporal there. It's sort of, that's the borderline of everything that's in there. That's holy, okay? Except with the antennas, it's got all this writing on it, all these pictures and prayers, and it usually has, uh, has relics sewn into it. Why would you be so elaborate with this little with this little thing. I mean, ours is kind of white and sort of plain. Well, it's because over the centuries and millennia, orthodoxy had to learn that no place was safe for them to worship. And as soon as they finished the Eucharist, they needed to fold up what they had and run for it. So rather than build large freestanding altars, they used an antennas because they knew at any time persecution could come. They knew at any time there could be real sores, real pain, and real death. Some of the services done in hiding. Some of the services done on the run. And yet, this is the church that brings us Jesus Christ conqueror. Why? Because he's not the kind of conqueror like the Colossus of Rhodes. Standing there astride in might and glory, holding a sword and saying, Look at me and despair. He is the kind of Colossus, a little like the Statue of Liberty, Enjoy peace and freedom and an abject humility and what looks like a loser. Saying, come to me and find rest. <clears throat> For your enemies have been conquered. They may look like they're winning, but in the end, they won't. Not suffering, not disease. Not sadness, not death. For Christ, our conqueror, has defeated them all. And in this mortal life, sometimes it feels like we're still in the short end of the stick. And very often, we probably are. And yet, Jesus Christ has conquered. The victory that comes in Him may be, let's call it elusive in this mortal life. Hard to feel victorious by the bedside of a dying friend. 
hard to feel victorious when your own body complains and fights against you. Hard to feel victorious when you're waiting for that next check to make sure that things maybe, just maybe, balance out. Hard to feel victorious when you look around and all there is to do and just think, oh, I don't even know where and how to start. And yet, we are promised victory, not everything we touch turning to gold, but promised victory that none of these things will have the final say, none of these things will put us so fully under its boot that we'll never rise again, none of these things will win. Not in the end, not forever, maybe for a time, maybe for a day. But the new Colossus, not the Statue of Liberty, but Christ himself, stands astride the world with a torch that lights from his own heart, standing with his cross, saying, all the losers win in me. Whether you've lost a lot or lost a little, they all win in me. Come to me and find rest. Come to me and find renewal. Come to me and find life. We play on his team, so we win too. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Can't say I feel super fantastic today. Yet we play on the winning team, nonetheless. And in the end, it's a good thing. So maybe we will never be a mega church. Maybe we will always be counting nickels and dimes and pinching pennies and floating one bill to the next. Maybe not. But if we do, we're playing on the winning team. Christ our Lord, the everlasting Colossus. His light shines the way and no darkness shall overcome whether we feel tired and poor, whether we feel like wretched refuse, whether we feel homeless or tempest tossed. We have found safe haven and a new life in Him. And this his victory shall be ours forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.